It's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question to the Premier. Um, Premier, as we begin the week, uh, sadly, in, in Liberal Ontario, Liberal government, uh, there are million people that work. Uh, I recently spoke to uh, a man in Niagara Falls who lost his job, at John Deere, part of the 300,000 manufacturing jobs lost. He talked to me about the impact on his ability to pay the mortgage, to pay the bills, and very importantly, first, he started out with the impact on his pride as a human being, as a dad, to provide for the family. Um, he did get a job parking cars for 11 or 12 bucks an hour, but says, can't we do a lot better than this? It's because of people like that that I brought forward my plan, the Million Jobs Plan, to create a good million jobs in our province, well-paying, middle-class jobs. So part of my plan is to lower taxes for all businesses to actually hire in the province again instead of giving out corporate Question. giveaways to the well-connected. Isn't it time to lower taxes to create jobs and help people like this man in Niagara get a good job for his family again? Stop the you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, I, I absolutely support the notion, and we are working very hard to make sure that we make the right investments in people, the right investments in infrastructure, and that we partner with business, Mr. Speaker, that we create those partnerships that will allow jobs to be created, Mr. Speaker. What I do not see from the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition is any way in which driving, uh, driving labour down, Mr. Speaker, driving good jobs out of the province, cutting and slashing across government and not partnering with uh, business, Mr. Speaker, all of which are pillars of his plan. I do not see how those tactics will create jobs, Mr. Speaker. We have created a net of more than 440,000 net new jobs since uh, 2009, Mr. Speaker. Employment Answer. went up last year, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue on our plan. You know, I think the Premier mistakes my plan with her own. And yeah. There's no doubt the Premier's plan has bankrupted our province. Yeah. It's cost us 300,000 manufacturing jobs, uh, and you put us deeper and, and deeper into debt. I, I think, Premier, if the plan's not working, isn't it time to try something bold, something new, and something that's optimistic and says that Ontario can lead again? That's my plan. That's my Million Jobs Act. Let me, um, for example, Kellogg's recently announced the closure of their plant in London. You gave Kellogg's a big corporate handout to create a small number of jobs, and in return, we're losing six or 700 jobs in London. don't think that works. You now have a plan before you. I think you're taking it to Cabinet uh, to do billions more in corporate handouts. You have a question before you. We should give Chrysler $700 million, a $1 billion. You've given handouts to Ubisoft and Samsung. My point of view, instead of corporate handouts to the well-connected, wanting to lower taxes for all businesses in every sector to succeed, to actually create jobs and create long-term middle-class jobs in our province, Thank you. that's a better way. Here. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think the leader of the opposition knows that taxes have been lowered in our jurisdiction, and we are competitive, Mr. Speaker. He also knows that uh, the HST, which was a conservative uh, policy, Mr. Speaker, which we implemented, was done expressly, Mr. Speaker, for the manufacturing sector, and the manufacturing sector knows that that was an important move, Mr. Speaker. But what the Leader of the Opposition is talking about, Mr. Speaker, is he's talking about walking away from the people who are working in plants in Oshawa, in Oakville, in Brampton, in Woodstock, and in Windsor, Mr. Speaker. He's talking about reversing a policy in this province to work with and support the auto sector that has been in place for decades. Mr. Speaker, Answer. I do not believe that he has thought through this policy, Mr. Speaker, because to abandon the auto sector and the auto parts Thank sector you. in Ontario would lose hundreds of thousands of jobs, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I'd appreciate, uh, while I'm standing, I'd appreciate the attention given to me by the Minister of the Environment, along with those that want to shout down somebody. So let's uh, cool it. Final supplementary, please. Uh, Premier, you, you've created a province of Ontario with higher taxes, unaffordable energy rates, more and more red tape. That means the only way for business to open up in Ontario is you have to bribe them with hundreds of millions of taxpayer subsidies. That's basically what it is. And I think you should start saying no to the corporate extortion that you've got yourself into. I mean, where are you going to draw the line? I think it's better to lower taxes for all businesses to succeed, to get affordable hydro in a province of Ontario again. 
get the heavy hand of government off their back so they can succeed. Now, it's just not me saying that. Your own economist, Don Drummond, said that your corporate welfare policies were not working. He said we should get out of that business, uh, Premier, and I agree. Let's actually create an environment, whether you're in the auto sector, whether you're in agribusiness, whether you're in financial services, whether you're in high tech. I want to see all rise in the province of Ontario. I want to see them all invest and create question. jobs. My question is, why don't you? You see it, please? You see it, please? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, what I would say is, why does the Leader of the Opposition not understand that partnering with business and supporting business, and particularly, Mr. Speaker, in this case, we're talking about the auto sector, that that partnership is decades old, Mr. Speaker. The naivete associated with uh, the Leader of the Opposition's position is quite stunning, Mr. Speaker. And I, I, you know, I go back to 1996-97, when there was $746 million put into uh, businesses in the province, Mr. Speaker, during the Harris years. 1997-98, $425 million. 98-99, $360 million. 99-2000, $414 million. 2,201, $717 million. Mr. Speaker, apparently the Leader of the Opposition and his colleagues used to understand that it was important in order for us to compete globally that we work with business, Mr. Speaker, that we put those supports in place. Apparently, he's lost the thread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any um, back to the Premier. I, Premier, uh, I was there. I was part of Cabinet. And what did we do? We lowered taxes. We had affordable energy rates. We got off the back of business. And, and the results, the results, we created an environment for 1.1 million new jobs in the province of Ontario. Let me point out your other major economic error that's chasing jobs in the province. The biggest area of subsidies from the McGuinty Wind Liberals uh, is the unaffordable handouts to wind and solar projects. The, the full tune is some $46 billion premium. You thought you'd build an industry where everybody could work at a wind farm or at a solar panel factory. We've actually lost jobs. For every short-term job we create, we lose four in the broader economy. Isn't $46 billion an awful, expensive price tag to actually cause jobs Question. to leave the province of Ontario? Okay. Just end that program. I would. You see that, please? You tricked me there. Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the Leader of the Opposition uh, supports uh, a healthy community. There's nothing more important to our party than the health of our citizens. Health has always been our top priority. The clean energy is helping to replace and has, in fact, replaced dirty coal. Mr. Speaker, that represents Member from a Chatham, cost Kent, of $4.4 billion in environmental and health care costs. Mr. Speaker, we had to build a surplus of energy in this province. We did it by also eliminating dirty coal, and we have built a safer, healthier community as a result of that. And Mr. Speaker, wind now represents less than 4% of our generation in the province of Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, less than 4% is not yes, a doomsday scenario that that Leader of the Opposition is claiming, Mr. Speaker. Thank he's you. exaggerating and he's not telling the truth. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I'd like to get to the next question. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the um, Premier. One thing, too, Premier, um, I don't know if you ever notice, it, it seems like hardly ever these grants go to Ontario companies. They're almost always international companies. Maybe it's because you want to cut a very expensive ribbon. So, for example, the biggest area of subsidy has been Samsung. Wow. Samsung, a Korean based company, would become incredibly rich. Now, you would never give money to a competitor of BlackBerry, right? You, you would never tell the people of Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge that you would give out hundreds of millions of dollars to the big competitor Samsung. But that's precisely 
what you've done. I don't know how you can reconcile this to taxpayers to say you're taking money out of their pockets, that you're taking money out of businesses or higher hydro rates to hand it over to an, an international competitor. Clearly, this is a policy that we can't afford. It's costing us jobs, and it's biased for people's investments outside the country, and we're hurting our own company. So, Premier, why don't you abandon this misguided, expensive policy and support my million jobs plan to Thank put you. people back to work in our great country? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank Development and Trade. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Speaker, and frankly, I can't believe what I'm hearing because a lot of our support goes to those great Ontario-based small, medium, and large-sized businesses. Just last Friday, I was in Cambridge, and we we uh, provided a uh, support through the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund for a great Ontario company, Cambridge Towels. That I know the people that are aware of that company understand just how important it is. We continue to support that made in Ontario. Company. Member from the P and Another Carlton company, will come to order. Which manufactures containers for our agricultural industry right across this country provided support as well on Friday through the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. Frankly, Mr. Speaker, I understand if the member opposite, if the leader of the official opposition can't see the importance of those made in Ontario investments, it's because his party and he didn't support the Southwestern Ontario oh, Development Fund, which together since the last year and a half has created and retained more than 24,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. You know, you know one, of the, one of the games, Speaker, my daughter, I think, learned in school is hot potato. Looks like they play a bit of hot yeah. potato over there. Everybody is trying to answer the question, except the Premier. The reason it's a hot potato is, is it because it's bad economic policy. Your Green Energy Act subsidies don't make any sense, and they're, the jury is in, Premier. It's costing us jobs. There is a better way to stop the subsidies and get affordable hydro for all. Also, you're forcing these projects into communities that don't want them. You're not even enforcing your own rules. For example, in West Lincoln, the Niagara Regional Wind Corporation and HAF Wind Energy, those projects are in a state of chaos. Five turbines have been built as part of that wind project, but three of them don't even meet your property line setbacks. They're effectively breaking the law. It seems to me if somebody breaks the law, then you take out the turbines. You make sure you follow laws in the province of Ontario. You think that would make some sense, but here's the bottom line. It costs us Question. jobs. It divides communities. You're not even enforcing your own laws. Why don't you get rid of this misguided, outdated policy and support my plan? It'll bring good jobs back and help Thank them. Thank you. John, your employer, work in the province of Thank Ontario. You. Please. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister? I, again, I just don't understand where the member opposite is coming from with this million job loss plan. Quite frankly, and we know, we already know, Mr. Speaker, that he's going to, if he gets into power, his party is going to cut 10,000 jobs among education workers, thousands more in the health care sector. He's already indicated he didn't support the Cisco investment, which is bringing 3,700 jobs to this province. We already know that he didn't support the auto sector in 2009. Frankly, if the party opposite had have had their way, we wouldn't have an auto sector, Mr. Speaker. Sorry. The member from Northumberland, the member from Heron Bruce, the member from Simcoe Gray will come to order. Finish, please. And Mr. Speaker, I know these are challenging times across the province, particularly in the Niagara region. I acknowledge that. But that's why I was proud to announce just recently two investments through, again, the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, Niagara Piston and Beansville, as well indexable cutting tours in Welland. And I was at the opening of Original Foods in Dunville in the Niagara region as well. More than 100 jobs created there, Mr. Sir. Speaker, importantly, Fantastic. in a community that really needed that help because of previous closures. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Premier. Over this winter, the Premier had uh, numerous opportunities to visit Niagara. How would she describe the state of unemployment in that region, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that, uh, first of all, I want to welcome the, uh, the new member for Niagara Falls. Welcome to, uh, welcome to the House. I did, I did have opportunities to visit uh, Niagara Falls before the uh, by-election was announced, Mr. Speaker, and after. And, Mr. Speaker, I know that there is a lot of work to be done in that community and in other communities across the province, which is why, Mr. Speaker, we have a six-point plan, which is why we know that investing in infrastructure— I heard about infrastructure investment and the need for infrastructure investment in Niagara Falls, Mr. Speaker, whether it's a hospital or whether it is uh, transit, Mr. Speaker, making sure that we have the right 
right GO Transit, the right municipal transit, Mr. Speaker. Those kinds of initiatives and those kinds of investments are very, very important, and that's why in infrastructure investment is very much a pillar of yes, our sir. economic plan. So we will continue to work with Niagara Falls. We will continue to work with communities across the province to make sure that those supports are in place. Supplementary. Speaker, what we heard from families was that they're feeling the squeeze and they're worried about jobs. There were over 100 families who relied on a paycheck from Virtus who are wondering how they're going to pay the bills now that the plant in Fort Erie has closed its doors. 90 people from Redpath in Niagara Falls are going to see an end to their paychecks in May. Speaker, Will the Premier tell those people that she thinks her six-point jobs plan is actually working? Well, Mr. Speaker, what I can what I can tell the uh, the leader of the third party is that there there are uh, there are situations where uh, companies have made changes and there have been job losses, and there are also situations where jobs are being created, Mr. Speaker. Just on uh, Friday, I believe, uh, the uh, Minister of uh, Children and Youth Services made an announcement in uh, in Windsor, an investment in Thomas Canning, Mr. Speaker, three million dollars uh, of 40 new jobs in a food processing plant, Mr. Speaker. Great. There are there are those kinds of investments, and the the uh, the companies that the Minister of Economic Development and Trade was talking about, Mr. Speaker, that are Ontario companies. They're small and medium enterprises, Mr. Speaker. They are the kinds of businesses that we know need support in order to be able to invest, in order to be able to expand and create jobs. That's what we're doing, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. That's the work that we're doing, and we are seeing those jobs stay and come to Ontario. And there's more work to be done, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Well, Speaker, for the years, the Liberals have insisted that corporate tax giveaways, the HST, and private power schemes would bring prosperity to Ontario, and they promised 600,000 new jobs. Can the Premier produce any evidence whatsoever of those 600,000 jobs, Speaker? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, more than 400,000 of them since 2009 have been uh, created, Mr. Speaker. So, um, and I, and I hope. I hope that the leader of the third party is supportive, for example, of our wine strategy, Mr. Speaker. $75 million over five years to make sure that the, the wine strategy in the very region that she's talking about is able to continue, that that industry that has grown up over the last 30 years, that it is able to thrive, Mr. Speaker. I didn't hear her endorsement when we made the announcement, but I can tell you that the wine and the grape growers, Mr. Speaker, were very supportive, and they wanted to hear that announcement. They wanted to know that we were going to continue those supports and that investment. So I hope that the leader of the third party understands that that's a critical part of that regional economy and deserves the support Answer. of all parties in this House, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Uh, to the Premier, Speaker, but I will say I'm glad the, re the Premier had time to read the NDP platform from 2011. Here, here. <laughs> Premier's no strings attached, corporate tax giveaways and loopholes are not creating jobs, Speaker, and people are falling further and further behind. Order. Families in Niagara not only see that, but they feel it. They see Ontario's unemployment is above the national average, and Niagara's unemployment is the highest in the entire province. Is the Premier ready to admit that the status quo simply isn't good enough for the families in Niagara or, in fact, anywhere across Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm never satisfied with the status quo, and in fact, we had a wine strategy in place in 2011, so it's, it's excellent that the leader of the third party put that into her platform. It would be interesting to know, Mr. Speaker, what the leader of the third party would put into a platform today, because we haven't seen support on minimum wage increases, Mr. Speaker. We haven't seen support on retirement security, Mr. Speaker. We haven't seen support for the Ford Erie plan. We haven't seen support for the wine and grape strategy that we've put in place, Mr. Speaker. We haven't seen support for increased investment in transit, Mr. Speaker. So I am very, very, very impatient, Mr. Speaker, which is why we have been moving on every one of those fronts, and we will continue. We will not rest on the status quo, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? Supplementary. The Premier needs not worry, Speaker. The NDP has lots of ideas at the Liberals <laughs> 
feeling the squeeze, though, it's not just that Liberal policies aren't doing the job when it comes to job creation. It's the government at Queen's Park seems to be going out of their way to make things even worse. That's certainly the story uh, for the residents of Fort Erie, who are fighting to keep jobs alive after the government's short-sighted attempt to kill the slots at Racetraps Partnership. Is the government willing to reconsider that short-sighted move? So, Mr. Speaker, uh, as the leader of the third party knows, the slots at racetrack program was, a, was not a transparent program. It was not accountable, Mr. Speaker. It was not a program that could be supported or should, quite frankly, have been supported by any party in this House, Mr. Speaker. We have put in place a plan that over the next five years will allow the industry to restructure, Mr. Speaker. There are contracts that are being, uh, that are being agreed on right now. The leader of the third party knows that we have been working with Fort Erie for months, long before there were any any questions in this House about the uh, racetrack industry, about the horse racing industry. There was not a question in this House. We were already working with Fort Erie. We have an arrangement, Mr. Speaker. There will be a 2014 season at Fort Erie. And, Mr. Speaker, what we're looking for is a Answer. good, solid five-year plan to make sure that that track is sustainable. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, for Niagara Region families worried about jobs, the plan they've seen from this government isn't very impressive at all. Instead of smart tax measures that reward job creators, the Liberals are opening up new tax loopholes and giveaways for companies to ship jobs away. Instead of providing affordable, accountable electricity so businesses can compete, the government blows a billion dollars a year to subsidize cheap electricity exports to the U.S. Instead of working on, uh, to protect local jobs, the Liberals went out of their way to kill the slots at Racetrack's partnership. Will the Premier agree that the Liberal plan is isn't working for communities like Niagara and admit that it's time for real change in this province. Thank you, Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to uh, I want to talk about some of the uh, the major investments that have been made in the region, apart from the uh, $75 million investment in the uh, wine and uh, uh, grape strategy, Mr. Speaker. SciTech Canada, uh, a grant of $2 million and a loan of $8 million was provided through the Strategic Jobs and Investment Fund, and that supports a total investment of $125 million to expand its Niagara Falls facility, and that project will create 30 new jobs and retain $100 five in Niagara Falls, Mr. Speaker. Rich Products of Canada Limited, uh, Fort Erie, uh, we announced a $3.9 million advanced manufacturing investment strategy loan to Rich Products to support a total investment of, investment of $13 million to protect, uh, will create five jobs and retain, 40, retain 43 jobs, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is that as we make these investments, as we develop these partnerships, there are commitments, Mr. Speaker. There are commitments to retention of jobs. There are commitments to yes, the creation of new jobs. That's the kind of partnership that works for the people of the region and the people of the province, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question. A member from Burlington. My question is for the Premier. Premier, in 1998, Honda opened a new plant in Alliston without yes. a government payoff. But in 2014, Ontario can't compete without massive handouts. Your government spent an estimated $3 billion a year in corporate subsidies, but nine-figure loot bags won't fix the problems with Ontario's economy. Job-killing red tape, sky-high hydro rates, taxes, taxes, and more taxes. That's right. Tax, Ontario's tax, manufacturing tax. sector has lost 300,000 jobs on your Liberal watch. Hey, yep. Trying to subsidize those jobs back would cost taxpayers tens of billions of dollars. Absolutely. Wouldn't it be cheaper to get the province's fundamentals right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Mr. of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud that Ontario remains the number one destination in all of North America for foreign direct and investment. And Mr. Speaker, 90% of the time when businesses choose to come here to Ontario, they do that without any government su support whatsoever. They have a great investment climate. We have a tax rate, which is lower than most of the U.S. states. We have a quality of the workforce, which is second to none, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker. We have a great health care system. Many reasons why businesses would choose to come here. And that's partly why, Mr. Speaker, we've added 25,000 manufacturing jobs since the recession. We've added 12,500 jobs 
jo the auto sector alone direct jobs, and I know the member opposite doesn't support the auto sector, and if she had her way, she would eliminate the auto sector from Ontario. We're not prepared to do that, Mr. Speaker. We support it. So yes, these measures are important, and we're actually succeeding. That doesn't mean that there's not much more work to do. We're constantly looking at ways to increase those investments and create Thank jobs. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the Premier. You can't spend your way to prosperity. Exactly. Your government should be creating a level playing field for all businesses. GM and Toyota have both said that it is the most expensive place in the world to build a car. The solution isn't to pay those countries to be your friend. It is to make our economy competitive. Paying out huge incentives while ignoring fundamental problems is like getting a new paid job to fix a broken transmission. Absolutely. University of Calgary professor Jack Mint says Tim Hudak's million the Job Act is the kickstart to Ontario's economy needs. Will you support him? No. You see it, please. You see it, please. I. Uh... Okay. Stop stirring it. A member from Cambridge, come to order. And the member from Renfrew. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I know that there are many people in that member's party that support the right to work legislation that will gut labour across this province. We're not prepared to do that. Frankly, I believe that the Leader of the Opposition still believes in that principle, Mr. Speaker. And I, ch I challenge the member opposite to go down to Windsor and tell the 4,600 people that are working at that Chrysler assembly plant that in two years' time they won't have their jobs if the Conservatives get to power. And I challenge that, that member opposite as well to go to the Ford plant in Oakville and meet with many of her own constituents from, from from Burlington, Mr. Speaker, and tell them that she did not support the Ontario government's investment in Ford last September, where her federal cousins, the federal PC party, came forward with Ontario equal measure to support Answer. those jobs, retaining those jobs in the future. I know she didn't support the Cisco proposal to create 3,700 jobs in this province. Thank you. I know she doesn't support Chrysler. New question. Member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Niagara has the highest unemployment in Ontario. For some people, it's just a number. I've met those people. I met, met with them in the coffee shop, talked with them on the phone, talked with them in the living room, and now I'm standing up here for them at Queen's Park. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about their jobs for their kids and their grandkids. These are real people facing real challenges. Does the Premier think that her jobs plan is working for the people across Niagara? across Niagara Falls riding who are wondering question oh I'm sorry <laughs> in, uh, in in fairness in fairness to the member and all new members that will be coming when I say that you have about 10 seconds to wrap up just so that you know from, from here on in. Premier. Mr. Speaker, and again, I welcome the member, and I know that he is an advocate for his community, Mr. Speaker. Our job is to advocate for all of the people across the province, Mr. Speaker, and to make sure that region by region and community by community, we put the right conditions in place, which is why we've made those investments in Niagara Falls and the Niagara region that I spoke about earlier, whether it's the wine and grape strategy, Mr. Speaker, whether it's manufacturing plants, Mr. Speaker, who need support in, in order to be able to compete, 
whether it's the investment in the hospital or the support for the uh, racetrack, Mr. Speaker, that will allow those people, who I, many of whom I have met, Mr. Speaker, who need those jobs and need to make sure that there is a strategy. I hope that the member is able to work with his caucus and to understand that support for those businesses is absolutely critical. That's why we put that in place. And also, Mr. Speaker, support for policies like the minimum wage increase and like retirement security are things that we have to work together on, Mr. Speaker. There are young people across Niagara Falls riding who are wondering if they'll be able to stay in their hometown. Because to stay, they need the kind of good jobs that will let them raise their own families. They want to be able to live, work, and raise their families in Niagara. I'm going to stand up for their jobs. Is the Premier ready to admit that the status quo isn't working and it's time for a plan that rewards job creators, cut small business taxes, and get people in Niagara and across Ontario working again? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I also want to congratulate the member opposite for his election uh, win and representing that important riding here in the legislature. And I'm glad that he mentioned youth specifically, Mr. Speaker, because apart from the fact that just last month, or sorry, in January, uh, the province created 7,800 youth jobs alone for youth between the ages of 15 and 25. Uh, that youth unemployment rate is gradually coming down. It is unacceptably unacceptably high, but that's part of the reason why we've created our youth jobs initiative, $295 million investment over two years, which includes, importantly, Mr. Speaker, our youth jobs fund, administered by my colleague behind me, the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. And just the latest information on that youth employment fund, which are new hires in businesses across the province, as of February 21st, 7,934 young people have received placements and jobs because of that program, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Ottawa, Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Representatives of the Heart and Stroke Foundation and Canadian Cancer Society are joining us in the House today. I met with four of them this morning. Every seven minutes in Canada, someone dies from heart disease or stroke. Many of these deaths are preventable, and the risk factors are well understood. And smoking is one of these risks, and kids are especially vulnerable to its harms. There is a bill before the House now, the Youth Smoking Prevention Act, which would help to protect children from harmful tobacco smoke. I would like to ask the Minister, through you, Speaker, how important it is that this proposed legislation, legislation be passed swiftly. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the member from Ottawa, Orleans, who is a huge champion of these issues. In fact, it's the McNeely Amendment to the Smoke Free Ontario Act that banned power walls. Uh, Speaker, I, I too welcome and thank the representatives from Heart and Stroke and Canadian Cancer uh, for their life saving work. Speaker, the stark reality is that smoking kills 36 people in Ontario each and every day. That's why it's so important to quickly pass Bill 131. I believe we have all, uh, all party support for that. I was pleased that the Leader of the Opposition uh, has written a letter uh, supporting, uh, supporting the Youth uh, Smoking Prevention Act. And Last week, the member from Nickel Belt has indicated she'd like to see this bill move quickly. Unfortunately, though, Speaker, Bill 131 has been stalled yes, in this legislature. We would like to see it move it more quickly, and we're calling on all parties to quickly move this bill through the legislature. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, I'm pleased to see our government is placing such a high priority on protecting kids from tobacco smoke. I hope that the opposition will work with us to send the bill to committee very soon. But smoking isn't the only risk factor that can lead to heart disease and stroke. Healthy eating is important in maintaining a healthy heart, and a good eating habits start young. Our government has taken steps and is always looking at other initiatives to keeping Ontarians, especially children, healthy. Speaker, can the minister tell us what our government is doing to help ensure our children are eating nutritious food? Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the, the member from Ottawa, Orleans. Speaker, we know that healthy kids grew up to be healthy adults. That's why we created the Healthy Kids Panel, and we've taken strong action to implement uh, many of its recommendations. We've announced an expansion of the Student Nutrition Program. We've enhanced supports 
for breastfeeding moms, and we started the Healthy Kids Community Challenge. Last October, we committed to introducing legislation that would require the posting of calories in large chain restaurants after consultation with health leaders, food service industry, and above all, parents. I believe this is something all three parties can support. I certainly know that the member from Nickel Belt has advocated menu labeling herself. As with Bill 131, I'm reaching across the aisle to ask the third party to stop stalling important bills uh, moving yes, through the House, and then when this bill is introduced, let's get it passed. Your question, the member from the Key and Carlton. Thanks uh, very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. The Green Energy Act has cost this province billions of billions. Dollars, dollars for energy we don't need at a price we simply can't afford, Premier. The government promised at the time 50,000 new jobs in turn for massive $4 billion annual subsidies to wind and solar. You stripped away locally-based decision-making. The jobs never materialized, but skyrocketing hydro rates have. The Auditor General went so far as to say that for every job created by the Green Energy Act, four were lost here in Ontario. Your own Liberal uh, long-term energy plan says that you will subsidize this, uh, this uh, policy with 42 per cent increases in our hydro rates. The cause and effect are proven. And it's time to move on from this policy. Question. Today we'll have people from rural Ontario here marching to ask you to listen to them to stop the Green Energy Act. Will you listen? Will you rip up the Green Energy Act? Thank you. Seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Uh, the member from Durham. The member from Durham will come to order. And as I get quiet, I want quiet. Premier. Minister of Energy. Well, I thank the uh, critic for the uh, for the question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, from Leeds, uh, I know that there were some uh, wind uh, anti-wind demonstrators outside uh, the legislature, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they were mothers for uh, for no wind. I think that the name or sim similar name. And I met with them uh, uh, several months ago, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly appreciate their commitment and their concern. As I indicated earlier, Mr. Speaker, uh, green energy has replaced dirty coal. A dirty coal, Mr. Speaker. Dirty coal, Mr. Speaker, was causing 4.4 billion, billion dollars in health costs and environmental costs, Mr. Speaker. On the other hand, their position, Mr. Speaker, on the other side is very confusing. First of all, the leader of the opposition said he will cancel wind contracts, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Then he said he would not cancel wind contracts. Now, Mr. Speaker, that caucus over there is telling constituents Thank you. maybe they. Will will cancel wind contracts. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the thing that's uh, replacing dirty coal is nuclear. It's gas. It's hydroelectric. Not expensive wind turbines at the expense of freedom in the rural areas of this province. Your, your Green Energy Act is bankrupting this province. It is costing us to lose jobs. The World Trade Organization agrees. They say it's a dud. You are the only jurisdiction in all of Canada, the first province to break international law in the history of our nation. We haven't even gotten to the environmental and health effects of, uh, of what's happening to birds, what's happening to turtles, and what's happening to humans. There is no due process for municipalities, and your environmental review tribunal has become a sham, and it's disgraceful. Health Canada and Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy are studying and health question. I'm asking the Premier if she won't scrap the Green Energy Act today, will she at least signal to Ontario that doesn't want these wind turbines, they don't have to put up Thank you. and she'll have a moratorium to place her property. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister of Energy. And, uh, the member from Durham is using this as an opportunity every time, and I'm going to ask him to stop doing that. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Green Energy Act has created over 31,000 jobs in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, uh, several weeks ago, uh, I met with senior officials from Siemens, uh, and we discussed a number of issues, including job creation. They indicated that their Tilsonburg plant, Mr. Speaker, for wind turbines, is continuing to create more jobs than originally estimated, probably in the order of 200 jobs, Mr. Speaker. I visited Celestica uh, in uh, Don Valley uh, uh, last week, Mr. Speaker, and they're planning on doing expansion uh, in uh, in uh, clean energy, Mr. Speaker. 
The jobs are continuing to be created. We haven't compiled them all, Mr. Speaker, because they're happening across the province. And I hear example after example after example, Mr. Answer. Speaker, of new jobs be being created in clean energy. And, Mr. Speaker, we have people coming out of our community colleges who are well versed in clean energy, and they're going to clean Thank you. cleaner. Thank you. Your question, member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the construction of the promised new Niagara Falls Hospital can be an important source of local jobs at a time when families in Niagara are facing the highest unemployment rate in the province. What guarantees can this government give to the people and companies in the Niagara region that the construction of the new Niagara Falls Hospital will hire local and by local. Minister of Citizenship and Order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Health will want to speak to this great project, but uh, I want to just say that we were very pleased to be able to announce $26 million for a planning grant for uh, the new hospital in Niagara Falls, a firm commitment that we are going ahead with that, Mr. Speaker. We're following through on Dr. Kevin Smith's uh, expert advice, Mr. Speaker. Um, it was very clear, actually, during the, uh, uh, the past few weeks that it it was not necessarily the position of the NDP to build that hospital, Mr. Speaker. There was a, a, a real lack of uh, commitment, and it wasn't clear whether the hospital would be built in Welland or somewhere else, or all the other services would be kept in place, and the hospital would be built in Niagara Falls, which would be a particularly irresponsible position. So I'm very, very pleased that we are committed to better health care in Niagara Falls. Answer. We're committed to building the hospital, Mr. Speaker, and we're following through on that commitment. Premier, jobs are the most important issue for the families in Niagara. When it comes to building large infrastructure projects, this government should be looking to create as many local jobs and opportunity for workers, engineers, architects, contractors, to shore up the local economy in Niagara. What is this government doing to make sure that the promised new Niagara Falls Hospital construction will provide as much needed local jobs by hiring locally, stimulating local businesses, and by purchasing locally made products. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, Speaker, I am delighted that we finally have some clarity about where the NDP stands when it comes to the construction of a new hospital yeah. in Niagara Falls. Yeah. Speaker, I congratulate the new member. He's having an impact already, and I look for further clarity on NDP Wait positions on, say, minimum wage coming from the newest member of that caucus, Speaker. So I am delighted that uh, we, uh, we have moved forward with a planning grant for the new hospital in South Niagara. I know that will benefit uh, the constituents of the member from Niagara Falls and the member uh, and members of the whole Niagara region. This is an important step forward to improve the quality of care, and I really do urge the uh, member opposite to vote, vote for Bill 141, which will support local uh, local employment. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Question the member from Scarborough Aging Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, as a father, you know how tough it's been balancing work life, looking after your children, and working support your aging parents or both. That's why I'm proud to support Bill 21, the Leaves to Help Families Act, which seeks to provide Ontarians with three different leaves that they can use when at times they're concerned about. It's just being there to support the family. Having worked as a nurse, I feel strongly about this bill and its intent to ease the stress on everyday lives of Ontarians. In my riding of Scarborough Agent Corps, the residents strongly support this bill, and I brought 12 petitions to the House on this particular bill. However, it is frustrating, Mr. Speaker, to see that all three parties have worked together in committees to improve the bills is now stall a third reading debate. We could easily pass this bill by now Question. and help. So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what kind of reaction to the ministry regarding this delay in terms of Bill 21? Thank you, Minister Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to uh, thank the member from Scarborough Agent Code for her relentless advocacy uh, in regards to Bill 21 uh, to ensure that we have family caregiver. Uh, uh, provided for in our province. Speaker, we have heard from sole caregivers and those in the sandwich generation on the importance of this very important bill. And we've heard frustration from many stakeholders that they came to watch 
third reading debate that this bill was being bogged down in unnecessary uh, debate in this House, Speaker. Speaker, I'm talking about the Caregiver Coalition, which com is composed of the MS Society, the Alzheimer's Society, uh, the Parkinson's Society, the ALS Society, the, uh, the representatives, a speaker from the Heart and Stroke Foundation and the Canadian Cancer Society are in the House, uh, urging all members to, uh, to expedite the debate on this very important bill and to pass this bill into law so that we can give the much necessary break Answer. that our families deserve for looking after for uh, their loving caregivers. So I urge and implore all the members of, uh, of this House, especially Thank the you. opposition speaker, to vote in support of that bill. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for the response. I must admit that there's a frustration in terms of hearing the debate, the third reading debate. When we start a third reading debate, Mr. Speaker, members of opposition continue to filibuster and stalling tactics and go on rearing off different speaking points and recycling speaking points, Mr. Speaker, and rambling on different topics on the issues not related to the Bill 21. This bill should have been passed like any other many of the legitimate bills that brought before the House, Mr. Speaker. Yet the opposition continue want to make change a third a third reading debate. So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please explain some of the finer points of this bill that we have, may have missed? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member again. Speaker, this bill is first and foremost about uh, compassion, compassion that we owe to our, our loved ones and, of course, uh, the families, the caregivers who look after them in time of need. Today, Speaker, I'm asking the opposition to think about the Ontarians that are struggling every day to balance their work and family responsibilities when deciding whether or not to stall this bill any further. I'm asking the opposition speaker to acknowledge the support of the Heart and Stroke Foundation and the Can Canadian Cancer Society and the countless others that have put their support behind this bill, the same bill they are keeping from becoming law. Speaker, it is absolutely clear this is not a partisan issue. The, the content of the bill are not controversial at all. It really speaks to the core value of our society, where we look after our families, we look after each other to make sure that caregivers have the necessary Answer. job protection that they need to look after their loved ones. Let's pass this bill into law so that our families yeah. have the necessary supports they need yeah. at home to look yeah. after their loved ones. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, a member from here, Amber. My question is for the Premier. Premier, people across Ontario are gathering on the front lawn today to bring yet another message. Your green energy scheme has failed, and the rubber is finally hitting the road as electricity bills are skyrocketing for all Ontarians, urban and rural. No matter which way they spell it, it's a no-win situation. Your government turns its back on proponents when they break the rules. You take municipalities trying to stand up for their constituents to court. You tell government employees who try to do the right thing to stand down. You ignore the facts determined by your own $1.5 million University of Waterloo health study. And here's the kicker. Your government actually appealed itself when an ERT did the right thing and said no to a proponent. Premier, Will you do the right thing, stand up, have the confidence today, Question. personally go out and address the group that are outside, admit to your corrupt mistakes, and Thank call you. for an immediate moratorium? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I know that the Minister of Energy will want to comment in the supplementary, but I think the member opposite the member knows, Mr. Speaker, that I have met with, uh, with folks seat. who have a strong opinions about uh, wind energy across this province, Mr. Speaker, uh, repeatedly in community after community. And, Mr. Speaker, I, I know that the member opposite doesn't want to talk about the fact that cleaning up the air is at the root of this, Mr. Speaker. I know that the member opposite doesn't want to talk about the reality of 31 thousand jobs that have been created, Mr. Speaker, but I do think that the member opposite should acknowledge that when I came into this office, I said we were going to change the rules about citing these uh, energy infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We've done that. We've done that, Mr. Speaker, and we've worked with municipalities. The member from Renfrew, the member from Prince Edward Hastings, and the member from Northumberland, and the member from Huron Bruce who asked the question, come to order. Good on that commitment, Mr. Speaker, Answer. to change the process whereby these uh, uh, energy, these pieces of energy infrastructure are cited, and we will continue to work with municipalities on that front, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. 
supplementary. The member from Halliburton, Fourth Lakes, Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd, I would like the Premier to uh, answer my supplementary. My constituents and others are currently appealing uh, over the 50 story industrial wind turbines planned on the Oak Ridge's moraine. The moraine is an ecologically important because it provides clean, safe drinking water to over a quarter of a million people. It's been protected since 2002. The community has spoken out against these wind turbines. 2,874 people commented on the EBR posting. The Buddhist Association of Canada opposes the project. No, like the, cur the Curve Lake First Nation insists further consultation take place. Many constituents of my writing have travelled to Queen's Park today, yet again to protest. Premier, you've turned your back on the protection of the Oak Ridge's moraine and your supposed consultation process. Will you immediately call a moratorium on the wind turbines, especially the ones on the Oak Ridge's moraine? Cedar, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I addressed the, uh, the issue uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the reality is the leader of the opposition has said he will not cancel existing wind contracts. They're talking about an existing wind contract, Mr. Speaker. What is your policy? Are you going to cancel it? Are you, are you going to expose the province uh, to uh, more liability, Mr. Speaker? The group that is outside this legislature, Mr. Speaker, there are mothers who are concerned about health. Mr. Speaker, I want to repeat the point by eliminating dirty coal. Order. The health impacts of getting out of dirty coal for Chatham, Essex, second time, second seat. And environmental costs, Mr. Speaker. 668 fewer premature deaths per year, Mr. Speaker. 928 fewer hospital admissions per year, Mr. Speaker. 1,100 fewer Answer. emergency room visits per year, Mr. Speaker. 333,000 minor illnesses such as headaches, coughing, and other respiratory symptoms avoided, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. That's why we're in renewable energy, Mr. New question. Member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. When this government pulled the slot machines from racetracks across Ontario, the hardworking families that depend on the racing industry felt like they had the carpet ripped out from underneath them. Now the Premier has been doling out short-term funding when the timing suits them which in the case of Fort Erie happened to just come in time for the by-election, during the by-election. Families in Fort Erie can't plan a future based on one-year funding. Will the Premier commit today to a long-term partnership with the Fort Erie racetrack that will give families a future that they can look forward to? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the member opposite is fully aware that Elmer Buchanan and John Snowblin and John Wilkinson formed a panel, Mr. Speaker, and worked on a five-year plan, Mr. Speaker, in which we are investing $400 million. So we are putting in place a long-term plan, Mr. Speaker. We want that kind of sustainability. And the the snide remark that the timing of the uh, the Fort Erie uh, uh, contract deal was uh, coincided with the by-election. Mr. Speaker, again, the member opposite knows full well that we were working for months before there was even a by-election called to make sure that every racetrack in this province had the opportunity for a sustainable future. That's the work that we've been doing. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. I made a commitment to put the uh, horse racing industry back on track. We've been doing that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, it's interesting, Speaker, that the announcement actually came when the Liberals were trailing in the polls. Yeah. So, Speaker, it, any business will tell you that long-term planning is crucial. And since the slots were pulled from the Fort Erie racetrack, families who depend on a track had no way to plan for the future. Short-term funding, vague promises of a five-year plan that may one day be released. They had to march in the streets. They had to march here at Queen's Park for months before the Premier would listen. One-time funding and vague promises are not a plan for the families who live in Fort Erie. Will the Premier reinstate the slot at the racetrack's partnership so that horse racing can continue in Fort Erie and sustain over 1,000 jobs locally? Mr. Speaker, we're not going to reinstate a plan that was unaccountable, that was not transparent, and was not in the best interest of the long-term industry, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to do that. And we've been working on putting a better plan in place, and that is what we have done. $400 million 
over the next five years. And Mr. Speaker, the NDP was crying for a season for Fort Erie in 2014. Mr. Speaker, they were screaming from the rooftops that that's what they wanted when they finally got to the issue, which was long after we had already started working on it. Mr. Speaker, so the plan is in place. We are going to continue to work with Fort Erie. The people of Fort Erie who work at the racetrack know I have met with many of them, Mr. Speaker. They know that I am committed to making sure we do everything possible. Yes, but there will be a bill. There will be a business plan, Mr. Speaker. There will be a transparent exchange of dollars as part of that plan, and that is why we are going to continue to work with them, Mr. Speaker. The question the member from Scarborough Gilbert. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Minister, in days past, the electricity system in Ontario could be described as a bunch of wires attached to wooden poles, powered by a generator and turned on by the flick of a switch. And while I know our electricity system has been modernized with the advent of smart meters and smart grids, to some today, the system appears the same. Mr. Speaker, could the minister tell us how these new technologies are changing how we interact to use our electricity system? Minister of Energy. I thank the member for the question, Mr. Speaker. Several weeks ago, uh, I had the opportunity to visit Barry and the new IBM State of the World uh, data center in Barry, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they are analyzing information from smart meters uh, and other information uh, in order to create a more efficient energy sector. And not only that, Mr. Speaker, that is another example of clean energy creating jobs in Ontario. In fact, Mr. Speaker, smart meters are modernizing our outdated, inefficient energy system. They help Ontarians conserve energy and save money. In 2006, conservation and our smart grid have saved our energy system over $4 billion in avoided costs. Smart meters help us conserve and allow local distribution companies to quickly determine when systems arise, uh, when system yes, issues sir. arise, and avoid them as quickly as possible. Mr. Speaker, the smart grid, the home of smart grid in North America, is thank Ontario. You. Mr. Speaker, supplementary. Speaker, through you, I want to thank the minister for his response. I believe my colleagues will agree with me that we need to continue to do more to promote conservation in Ontario. I know this is important to the people in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood. Speaker, I understand that smart meters allows us to control our energy usage during peak times to, to help save money and conserve power. I've also heard that during the recent ice storm, local Order. distribution companies like Toronto Hydro used smart meter data to assist with restoration efforts. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us if the ministry has any programs to leverage this new smart grid technology or if there is any way that I can access this information? Thank you, Minister. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, there's a lot of excitement in Ontario over smart grid and new technology in the energy sector. Mr. Speaker, a few months ago, in partnership with Mars Discovery District, we launched the Energy Apps for Ontario Challenge. This challenge is a great example of people using their ingenuity and creativity to create new tools that can inform the public. These apps will help Ontario households and businesses manage and better understand their electricity use so they can make informed decisions and save money. Using the smart grid data, Energy Apps for Ontario will empower consumers by providing easier access to their own electricity data and allowing them to securely share their data with mobile and web-based apps. They can actually, Mr. Speaker, get all of that data from their meter and use that Answer. to help create apps for themselves, new tools to conserve energy, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Simcoe North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is to the Minister of Training, College and Universities. Minister, a critically important part of your mandate is to uphold and enhance the skilled trades in this province. Here, here. Your exercise of this responsibility is vitally important to all the fine, hardworking men and women in the trades today, whether they are compulsory or mandatory trades. While we practice politics in this place, I know that you would not want the practice of politics to taint the work being done by the Ontario College of Trades. As such, will you commit today? to halt any compulsory certification review before the Ontario College of Trades until after the next election. Thank you. Minister of Trade College and Universities. What a political question for somebody who just said we shouldn't be uh, 
be, be playing politics with the College of Trades. Mr. Speaker, what I, what I will say is this. Uh, we're very proud of the work that we're doing, both as a government and the College of Trades is doing to promote the skilled trades across this province. Mr. Speaker, we have our Youth Apprenticeship Fund, which is doing some great work in our high schools to encourage young people to get into the skilled trades, which is so, so important. And Mr. Speaker, as we work with the federal government, we're working at ways to, to do even more to encourage young people to take on apprenticeships. We've doubled the number of apprenticeships in this province in the last 10 years. We're proud of that, but Mr. Speaker, there's more work that we have to do. Mr. Speaker, building a stable environment for the skilled trades across this province, building an environment yes, where sir. those skilled trade workers themselves have a say in those future decisions is the direction we're going, as opposed to making those decisions in smoky Albany room you. back rooms. Member. Okay. So you didn't answer the question to begin with, okay? So one of the greatest powers the Ontario College of Trades has is to change a trade from a voluntary one to a compulsory one. And Minister, the ramifications of such a change cannot be exaggerated. Should any tra trade be changed into a compulsory one, the process needs to be perfect. So I trust the minister could appreciate that the politics of a provincial election campaign, no question about it. And I trust the minister can also recognize that given your party is likely to be supported with hard, work, hard dollars from the very organization seeking compulsory certification, the election is no time to do that. And I can tell you, Mr. Minister, if you compulsory certify a trade like carpentry and let these guys do it down there right now, you can, con you can cripple the construction industry in the province of Ontario. So I'll ask you again, will the minister stand in his place today and commit to Question. any compulsory certification review should we go into an election. And it's very important, Minister. This is an important question. I don't want you to dance around this. A yes or a no would be fine. Minister? Okay, no. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the fact is, uh, and, and the, the member asked the exact same questions when we were going through the ratio reviews, concerned about process ahead of time, concerned they were going to get it right. And, Mr. Speaker, they did get it right because they reduced ratios. Uh, 20 times more, Mr. Speaker, than any other party did uh, over the course of time that they were in office, including our own. That's a pretty good accomplishment. The process went very well. Now, when they undertake the process for compulsory reviews, Mr. Speaker, they'll do that. But the difference between us and them is it will not be a political decision. It will not be a political decision made in the back rooms of the Albany Club. It'll be a decision made transparently by the College of Trades, by tradespeople themselves. So politicians like yourself who want to get involved in these and decisions sir. will not have a role to play in those decisions because they'll get it a lot better than politicians from any party who got it. it got Your it question? Member from Welland. The Liberals have told Ontarians over and over that they're going to deliver full day two-way go service on all corridors. But, Speaker, they're nowhere near delivering on that commitment. Families and businesses in the Niagara region have been clear. They need the service. They don't need higher taxes and fees. The people of Niagara Falls riding could see that the Liberals haven't delivered on their promise. And so they chose to elect a strong new Democrat who will get results for families and small businesses in our area. The 12 mayors and the regional chair have also issued a joint statement to the province to tell them to get moving by 2015 on all-day GO service to the Niagara area. My question to the Premier, when will you listen to the people of Niagara while in St. Catharines and commit to a date question? for delivering GO service in the Niagara region? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Transportation and Infrastructure. Mr. Transportation and Infrastructure. Thanks, uh Mr. Speaker, clearly the member from Welland has a sense of humour, which is good to know. Um, <laughs> half hour all day go service runs on the Lakeshore line. We are taking over from the parties opposite that made no investment in go, froze the funding, didn't acquire tracks, and let the system fall apart and rot. We have made up $20 billion in transit infrastructure, $10 billion. The reason that we cannot move faster is because when you were over here, you didn't buy any tracks from CNCP and you didn't invest in anything. So we're making up for 30 years of neglect, Mr. Speaker. I would invite the member to come down to Hamilton with me in the near future to see a few announcements about the results of those billions of dollars of expenditure. I'll just let you anticipate what that Answer. might be, because it wouldn't be happening if you were sitting over here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, member from Cambridge on a point of order.
Speaker, I uh, was listening intently to question period, and I hope I didn't uh, misunderstand what the government was saying. And I'm going to reference Standing Order 23 because they were talking about uh, family caregiver leave that has not received uh, or has not been debated at third reading. And I remember very vividly speaking positively of the bill, family caregiver leave, at third reading, Mr. Speaker. So I, I wonder what's going on in terms of trying to. Um, to, to mis perhaps mislead, but certainly of naming different. First of all, you will withdraw because you can't say that. So withdraw. Withdraw. Of all, that's not a point of order for the purposes of the question period. There are no further debates. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.